a special presentation of LOBN with archaeologist Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, along with my co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, also from La Sierra University, long history there, and a long history in archaeology in the Middle East as well. Mm -hmm. And we welcome uh, Dr. Robert Mullins, Bob, if we're okay with that. Yes, um, absolutely. From Azusa Pacific University, mm -hmm. teach archaeology. Yes, um, I do. Other classes too? Uh, yes. Any uh, biblical studies yes, classes? Yes, uh, biblical studies classes, mainly in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. All right. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the site of Bet She'an. Yes. An extremely important site. And to an archaeologist who's worked there, maybe the most important, the <laughs> best <laughs> site. That's uh, right. That's right. That's so, right. And we'll see why it's so important, mm -hmm. because uh. it truly is. And we want to think about its uh, appearance in the Old Testament, uh, biblical and archaeological comparisons mm -hmm. and contrasts, and what we can learn about it that might help us appreciate and understand Scripture mm -hmm. better. So thank you so much for coming and for being here. My pleasure. Now, I think it might be helpful if we learn a little bit about you. You teach at Azusa Pacific. Yes. Um, and we've talked about what fields. Um, you've been there for how long? Um, eight years now. Okay, mm -hmm. and you have been connected with archaeological projects for some longer period. Yeah, of much longer period of time. <laughs> I, I would say probably close to 30 years. Uh -huh. Right. In fact, my first time meeting you was in Jerusalem at the, the famous Albright That's Institute right. <laughs> uh, of Archaeological Research. And in fact, several times seeing you there. Yes. So you had several yeah. stints. And so worked at sites like Bet She'an mm -hmm. and sites like another one we're going to be thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, Bet, uh, or Tel Rehov. That's right. Um, and then you have now begun a new project, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll let you give us the Hebrew pronunciation. Yeah, the Hebrew is Avel Beit Macha, which means the meadow of the house or temple of Macha, so, which appears to be a personal name. Uh, oh, okay, mm -hmm. so it does appear to be a personal yeah. name. Now, you have excavated at other places. Yes, I have. Actually, my first excavation just out of high school, was at Tel Kassila, where we discovered the Philistine <laughs> temple at Tel Kassila. Uh -huh. um, I've dug at Lachish, um, Masada, mm -hmm. uh, Tel Dor. Uh -huh. uh, I've dug in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, I've even dug in Turkey um, okay. at Alalach, Tel Achana, right. also Zinjirli. Wow. So, yeah, I've... Um, dug a lot of different sites. Tell us a little bit about your family, too. Yeah, my <laughs> wife is also an archaeologist. Uh -huh. um, Hanan is, uh, received her PhD from the Sorbonne in, uh -huh. in Paris, France. She works primarily in Lebanon, um, where she's been involved for several years at Tel Arca, in uh, nearby Tripoli in northern mm -hmm. Lebanon. Okay. And you have a daughter. We have a daughter, Raya, who just turned 11 today. That's excellent. <laughs> so. excellent. Uh, our congratulations to her yeah. and yes. to the family. So. <laughs> Thank you. Let's think about the site, mm -hmm. Bet She'an. Yeah. It shows up in numerous places. I mean, if we think about texts, mm -hmm. and then if we think about artifacts. And yeah. Text and artifact, kind of the, the dialectic, the dialogue between those two sources of information. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of texts talk about Bet She'an? And we'll include the Bible in that. Uh, what, yeah. what text would involve uh, the site? Yeah, we do have some Egyptian texts that refer to uh, Bet She'an. For example, Thutmose III, um, who is a famous pharaoh um, preceding t King Tutankhamun. Um, he made a military campaign, and Beit She'an is one of the cities that he conquered. Um, it also gets mentioned by Seti I, who's the father of Ramses II, in a military campaign he carried out uh, to the region. 
So you do get a few of these Egyptian references to it, as well as in the Bible, as you said. What right. were the Egyptians doing, coming, campaigning up into Palestine with yeah. their armies and so on? What were they looking for? Why were they there? Well, the main reason the Egyptians were there is they wanted access to the land of Canaan uh, to exploit it economically. Mm -hmm. um, Canaan, for example, had olive trees, which mm -hmm. you don't have in Egypt. Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so oil was a very valuable commodity. Um, you ha also had um, bitumen from the Dead Sea that mm -hmm. they could use to cock their boats. Mm -hmm. It also served a very important military function, a strategic function as well, because you had the empires of the Hurrians um, in Turkey to the north, followed later by the Hittites. Mm -hmm. So both were like major players uh, that the Egyptians were very concerned about them coming south and maybe invading Egypt. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in this way, Canaan served as a, a buffer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and part of their goal was to establish garrisons at mm -hmm. key sites mm -hmm. and, uh, in Canaan uh, in order to control the region militarily, exploit it economically. Mm -hmm. And Beit Shan was, in fact, one of these Egyptian garrisons. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because when I learned about uh, Thutmosis III and his connection with Beit Shan, it immediately struck us because at our site in Jordan, mm -hmm. uh, Tel El Amari, we now have two uh, stamped jar handle impressions. Mm -hmm with Tutmosis III's cartouche on them. Probably a later use, yeah. probably a couple hundred yeah. years later. Mm -hmm. um, but that's but an it showed how important he was and how that uh, importance carried on through history. Uh, the yeah. influence up through yeah. mm -hmm. what would be, we would think of now as Israel, Palestine, West Bank, and mm -hmm. Jordan. Mm -hmm. That's Israel. right. Uh, very important. We, we are looking uh, in this picture at Tel Bet Shan. Um, do you want to say anything about it at this point? Uh, we're going to look at, yeah. at a slide in a few minutes yeah. that will locate it um, with the north-south mm -hmm. uh, axes and so on. Well, I think one of the things worth pointing out at this juncture is that it is the tallest mountain in Israel. Mm -hmm. Tallest mound, archaeological yeah, mound yes, in yes, Israel, yes. and you get a little bit of an impression with that, um, uh, with this photo. Uh, this view, by the way, is looking westward right. towards um, the Mediterranean Sea, towards Megiddo, the mountains of Gilboa, where Saul was killed in battle with the Philistines. It's the mountain that you see on the left there left-hand side. Right. And uh, in the narrative, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, the Philistines bring Saul's body and the body of his son Jonathan and hang them on the city walls. And one of the questions, of course, is why did they do that? Why hang his body on the city walls? But if you look at the mound and see how high it is and how it's visible from all around the area, it makes perfect sense mm -hmm. that they'd want to impale them there or hang them there so they'd be in full view of all the inhabitants it, in right. the region. Display. This is yes. a display of power. Mm -hmm. um, and the map on the right uh, locates it. We are thinking right up here. With yes, the right there. It's about a half hour drive south of the Sea of Galilee. Right, right. In the Jordan Valley. In the Jordan Valley, so, right at the junction of the Jordan Valley, which runs north south, linking the Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea, and the Jezreel, and the Jezreel Valley, Jezreel Valley, which is the valley that you see in the picture right, running which westwards. Is this way. Up That's toward, right. Uh, Haifa. By way of Megiddo, uh, going to Haifa. Absolutely. It's going to be important to keep that in mind. But we have another map that, mm -hmm. that brings us closer. Yes. And I think this is a terrific view yes. of the site. Tell us about the major division here. I mean, one sees this mound, but one also yeah. sees something happening yeah. uh, down below. Yeah, if you look, look at the map here, this is the Tell. This is the Old Testament site of Beit Sha'an here. Um, at the foot of it, you see something going on here. And this is the Roman Byzantine, Hellenistic Roman Byzantine city of Scythopolis, city of the Scythians. Um, it was the chief city of the Decapolis. Um, during the New Testament period. So essentially, Old Testament tell, and at the foot of it, the New Testament uh, city. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we come back to look at the classical or the Roman uh, city, let's think about the Capolis and, yes. and what that is. I mean, it's been defined in different ways, right. maybe understood in a lot of different right, ways. Too, right, right. But let's come back and think about okay. that. Okay, no, definitely. Okay. Now, as you can see here, um, there are actually two um, books of the Bible that refer to the death of Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 31 gives one account, and uh, 1 Chronicles 10 gives another account. Um, uh, but essentially, um, th this would be the, probably that you might say the major biblical reference to Beit Sha'an mm -hmm. would be the death of King Saul. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to that because we'll we really want to think about some yes. dimensions in mm -hmm. the story 
Um, <laughs> and part of our purpose in this whole program is to, to see the links between yes. archaeology and the Bible That's and right. other texts, of course, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And the links aren't always smooth, but uh, typically they're always helpful mm -hmm. uh, and giving us some enlightenment yes. of, of one kind or another. So we then think about this important word Canaanite. Yes. Uh, anybody who reads the the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, yeah. bumps into Canaanite early That's right. on. That's so right. So talk to us about the Canaanites yeah. and what this represents. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the, the previous slide that we looked at is um, is that story, of the death of King Saul, that many mm -hmm. people know from Sunday school and mm -hmm. and and know the story. What they don't realize always, though, is that there were people there before um, the Philistines were there, the Canaanites, or the Israelites were there, and, um, and the, the earlier inhabitants um, would have been Canaanites. Mm -hmm. um, and the Canaanites would have been the indigenous inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Uh, which, uh, at least historically, has been essentially the um, areas of, that we know today as Lebanon, uh, western part of Syria, mm -hmm. Jordan, Israel, West Bank, Palestine. Mm -hmm. Um, what would the dating be of this period for the Canaanites? Yeah, um, what you see if you look here, uh, the Canaanite house that comes from the early Bronze Age, this is the very beginning of when cities first begin to form. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the earliest examples that we have of structures at Beit Shan. It dates to around 3200 BC. Mm -hmm. So 5,000 years ago. Yeah, 5,000 mm -hmm. years ago. So we're also talking in the same period of time, if you go to Mesopotamia, for example, or you go to Egypt, you're getting the beginning development of writing mm -hmm. and also the beginning of civilization in those countries as well. And um, even though the Canaan kind of enters into that a little bit later than Egypt and Mesopotamia, it's not far behind. Not mm -hmm. too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other um, illustration shows a Canaanite temple. Yes. Um, and this one dates to about 1500 uh, BC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the interesting things about it is we read, for example, in the Bible mm -hmm. about how Solomon's temple was built in three parts or had three right. parts to it. And you actually see, if you look at the diagram here, that you do have an entrance room, you have a main hall, and then you have an inner chamber or holy of holies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a similar three-part division to this mm -hmm. Canaanite temple that you also find in, in Solomon's temple. Uh, by the way, I might point out that in the middle here, you see what looks like a post. Mm -hmm. And in the excavation of this, we actually found evidence that there was a post there. And one possibility as far as interpretation is that this is where an Asherah pole stood. Mm -hmm. um, and you hear about Asherah poles in the Bible. In the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Asherah and groves. Yes, uh, poles that's right. Because so poles would represent the goddess. Right. Yeah. Could we say the fact that Solomon has a, a, uh, a temple that with similar architectural features mm -hmm. that uh, God meets us where we are? Mm -hmm. People knew that uh, a place of worship was sort of built this way, and so along comes Solomon's temple in a similar way, just like uh, Christians mm -hmm. yeah. uh, have uh, yeah, grown we, out of earlier. Yeah, we have a sense of mm -hmm. what a church should be like. Right, right, right. And so um, we feel more most comfortable when you go into a building that feels like a church. Mm -hmm. And so I think for people back then, it was mm -hmm. the same thing. You're absolutely right. M maybe even the standing stones. Um, mm -hmm. You have those everywhere. It's like a steeple today. Yes, mm -hmm. so you that's right. Oh, <laughs> you have arrived. This is mm -hmm. a church. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be other things to tell yes. you, but those are clear indicators. Absolutely. Yeah. So we would have that too. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, we have some reliefs, and yeah. um, looks like an image on the yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about the Canaanite inhabitants right. of mm -hmm. Bashan, and um, actually, the uh, the top fragment you see there, the head, was found by the first excavator of Beit Sha'an, Alan Rowe, in the 1920s. He wow. found the head. Well, we found the body belonging to the same vessel. Isn't that amazing? Um, in our excavation. <laughs> and uh, so you can see the head of this Canaanite at the top, and you can see the body. Uh, he's holding, um, it's hard to say, but it might be a horn, mm -hmm. you know, a trumpet mm -hmm. of some sort that he's uh, holding. And, uh, but anyways, it gives us a little bit of an idea what the Canaanites of Beit Shan would have looked like. Mm -hmm. We have really, how many ways to know that kind of thing? I mean, mm -hmm. we have a few illustrations of Semitic people, right. certainly lots of Egyptian. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we have some inscriptions of people like J. Hugh and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. But this, would you say, is, I mean, how much do we know about Canaanite yeah, appearance? We don't, we don't know. Yeah, it's very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most famous ones is that um, uh, tomb relief uh, from Middle Egypt, which mm -hmm. uh, from the patriarchal period, mm -hmm. which shows, you know, this caravan, a group of, of Canaanites. But, um, I mean, that is so famous because it's really one of the few images we have of Canaanites. Mm -hmm. And so we can actually add this one now yeah. to our repertoire. Yeah, very good. Right, right, right. And uh, the on the left, the yeah, this is a, it, what's called a stela. Um, it shows a lion and dog, or some believe it might be a lioness in combat. The lion on the left, the lioness or the dog on the right. Um, probably having some sort of religious um, um, meaning. Uh, of course, lions, you know, play a um, significant yeah, role. Yeah, played a significant role. Religious in, and political. That's right. Leadership yeah, position. yeah. Right. So, it's a good example of Canaanite art mm -hmm. of around mm -hmm. 1400 or so BC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the lower one, uh, would, yeah. would would you put this? Would you? I mean, it's, it's, we're not talking about the same animal here. Well, it, the same, maybe it's usually understood as being the same okay. animal, okay. but it's difficult. I, um, one of the reasons it's been interpreted as a dog is the bottom one does look very Seems much like a dog. Like yeah. yeah, but if you look at the top one, they're more similar in size. The one on the right is a little bit smaller, and right. so some think too big for a dog, so maybe a lioness. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. But you know, that shows the interpretation involved in archaeology. Right, right, if you right. don't have an inscription that tells you what it is, mm -hmm. sometimes you know you have to figure out uh, on the basis of deduction what it right, might be. Right, and right. even then, sometimes you're not always <laughs> sure. Right. And you're, you're pulling different lines of evidence yes. together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the more lines you can get, the better yes. uh, you can mm -hmm. depend on your mm -hmm. interpretation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Okay, you need to show us what's yeah. happening on this map. Yeah, um, I think this uh, map is um, helpful because it helps one understand why Beit Shan was such an important city historically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, we we're talking about the Canaanites who would have been there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this whole area, you can probably see that today there are uh, beautiful fields here. Mm -hmm. There's lots of water, very um, fertile land. And so for the Canaanites that lived at this site, this was great agricultural area. Mm -hmm. um, Later on, however, the Egyptians take control of this site. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask yourself, of all the different sites in the country, why take control of Beit Sha'an? But if you look at it, it's a kind of Grand Central Station, mm -hmm. where Beit Sha'an is located here. And there is a road that goes from Beit Sha'an along the Jezreel Valley uh, by way of Megiddo all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. You can go eastwards from Beit Sha'an to Pella, which is in Jordan. Important site. Okay, Sinai. important Sinai. site in Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, from Beit Sha'an going northwards, it takes you up to the Sea of Galilee and to the points north into Lebanon. And then also, if you go south, you bypass Rehov, another site that I worked on, okay? And continuing down to Jericho and to point south. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems that the Egyptians wanted a site that was small and easy to control, which Beit Shan is not that large in mm -hmm. terms of um, area, and it's very strategically located. It's also at the very edge of their empire. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, it seems like, and you can correct me on this, mm -hmm. but that Egyptian control in Jordan kind of begins to fade out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there is some evidence for it, mm -hmm. but it seems that, you know, the real kind of eastern edge of their control was um, along the Jordan Valley. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so Beit Shan would have been positioned in a place where it's a kind of inland control center mm -hmm. um, for that eastern part of uh, right. Egyptian control mm -hmm. in the land of Canaan. Now, what we do have in Jordan are um, remains, cultural remains. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. but, but not the strong military. Yeah. I think that's you don't right. see, you, you don't see the garrisons It, it fades there. more quickly right. on that side of yeah. the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, speaking of Egyptian, mm -hmm. Egyptian influence, yeah. um, Talk about these particular uh, structures. Yeah, um, y on the left you're seeing a plan of the Egyptian garrison of uh, Beit Sha'an from the time of uh, Ramses yeah, the Third. Okay, right. this would be around, let's say, roughly, uh, let's say, 1200 BC. Mm -hmm. Thereabouts, uh, 1170 mm -hmm. or so right. BC. Judges. Okay, if you're thinking about that's the right. Period of the period. judges. Right. That's right. 
um, which is at the very, towards the very end of Egyptian control of Beit Shan. But it's a time when you really see a lot of Egyptian style buildings and architecture. And I just put pictures of just two examples. Uh, at the top you see the Egyptian governor's residence, which is this square shaped building with a kind of uh, room in the middle having uh, capitals where the uh, po uh, columns, yes, yes, columns with lotus uh, capitals mm -hmm. that you would find in Egypt mm -hmm. supporting uh, the roof. But, you know, such a building you would find in Egypt and you find it here at Beit Sha'an. And it was probably the residence of the Egyptian governor at Beit mm -hmm. Sha'an. And then the other uh, picture shows an Egyptian-style temple. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there. Um, and so, um, you know, good indication that we, we are dealing with, you might say, an Egyptian uh, stronghold in the land of Canaan. Um, one of the things that we did discover, it wasn't solely inhabited by Egyptians. In other words, you still had Canaanites living there, but essentially you had Egyptian officials, you had Egyptian soldiers, and then a certain number of Canaanites that served as mercenaries. Um, and also just continued to, to live in the town and serve it, Egyptian This kind interests. of structure suggests serious presence. I mean, this is yes. not something passing through. This is not something right. where the Egyptians came <laughs> and then left. I mean, they That's were right. here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and them. actually they were at Beit Shan for about 300 years, mm -hmm. all, all mm -hmm. totaled. And, and we should think about this biblically because the Egyptian influence, especially in the southern parts of what came mm -hmm. to be Judah and mm -hmm. then, of course, Israel, right. Um, were strong yes. uh, until you get to what we would call the time of the monarchy. That's and, right. Of the kings, mm -hmm. yes. and David and Saul and yes. so on. So. Yeah, and this would be another example of Egyptian artifacts from Beit Shan. On the left, we have a stela, a monumental stela, uh, of a type that has an inscription on it. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is of Seti I. And what it does is it describes a military campaign that he made to actually defend Beit Sha'an against Canaanite cities, mm -hmm. including Pella, that wanted to conquer it. <laughs> and so, so maybe um, it's good to have that Egyptian presence. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might not be mm -hmm. all bad. Yeah. And one of the things I mentioned were um, mercenaries that served the Egyptian interest at Beit Sha'an. And in the cemetery of, um, of Beit Sha'an, they found several masks, such as the type that you see on the right there. This particular one has a series of lines on the forehead, which um, some have described as looking very much like the feathered headdresses that the Philistines mm -hmm. are shown wearing in the release in Egypt, right. Medinet Habu, mm -hmm. um, Ramses III's mm -hmm. battle with the Philistines. We do know from Egyptian sources that Philistines and other sea people, such as the Sheridan, did serve as mercenaries mm -hmm. for the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. right. And so it may very well be that, uh, that this um, coffin mask. It is a clay, a clay, clay mm -hmm. um, yeah. ceramic. Uh, That's right. And, um, and it's, hu I mean, anthropoid, we call yes. it, because of the human yeah. uh, But features. what's very interesting about it is that burial in such coffins is not a Philistine ethnic practice. It's mm -hmm. really an Egyptian one, as everyone knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, Egyptians buried in, in such coffins. And so, you know, while this person might be ethnically Philistine, they're being buried in a style that um, is the way that Egyptians would be buried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the death of King Saul, yeah. the story. We alluded to it before. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly with that view we saw of the tell and how it's so tall and everything. We talked about why the Philistines may have chosen Beit Sha'an nearby as a place to mm -hmm. display Saul's body and that uh, and, and Jonathan's body as well. And there are these two uh, passages in Samuel and Kings that refer to it. Um, Samuel says they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and fashioned, fastened his body to the wall of Beit Sha'an. Mm -hmm. um, Chronicles talks about them putting his armor in the temple of their gods and hanging his head up in the temple of Dagon. Now, uh, one of the early archaeologists that worked at Beit Shan, uh, Alan Rowe from the University of Pennsylvania, excavated two temples belonging roughly to the time of Saul. Um, and those uh, two temples you see on the right there, uh, the top one he called the Northern Temple, and the bottom one he called the Southern Temple. Mm -hmm. And based upon both of these scriptures, he identified these as the Temple of Ashtoreth mm -hmm. on top mm -hmm. and the Temple of Dagon on the bottom. And so, for him, he saw these two temples as being the places where the Philistines put 
you know, Saul's you know, right. head and right. armor and right. so right. forth. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that in our excavations, we found really no evidence of Egyptian occupation of Beit Sha'an. Mm -hmm. We only have one pottery shirt of a type that you see in this, um, mm -hmm. uh, of this um, picture here. This is not so from Beit Sha'an, but it's the same type of You're suggesting no, no Philistine no occupation. No Philistine occupation during the time. During the time. Of, yeah. However, you know, with the Egyptians by this time having pulled out, it left mm -hmm. a kind of political vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Beit Sha'an may have been a part of uh, Philistine, political control, mm -hmm. but doesn't look like they actually had a colony or mm -hmm. any sort of actual presence there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which shows one of the ways that archaeology can kind of correct our yes. understanding, because yes. when you read the biblical narrative, you get the impression, as Roe did, that it was a Philistine city. Yes. Mm -hmm. But most likely, um, the temples that are being referred to here in this passage are back in Philistia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that they're just putting Saul's body there just to display to the local population, this is what mm -hmm. we can do, and we are basically the overlords here now <laughs> that the Egyptians are out. Right. Um, right. But certainly the fact that we do have a, a one sure does indicate some sort of trade, trade. Or some mm -hmm. sort so of some connection, presence. Right. some presence, right. some connection anyways mm -hmm. with Beit with Well, we have a couple of minutes to talk yeah. about the Roman period or the mm -hmm. New Testament uh, city of Beit Sha'an, right. um, known as Scythopolis, such, right. such an easy name to pronounce, <laughs> and part of the Decapolis. The Decapolis right. literally means ten cities. Right. Right. And was that always a consistent ten, or no. were things changing? It, and it tends to skirt several what we would now um, define as different countries. But that's uh, right. That's right. right. But you know, essentially, um, the Decapolis did involve um, you know roughly ten you know Greco-Roman mm -hmm. uh, centers. You know, centers of Greco-Roman culture, mm -hmm. um, of which. Scythopolis, uh, which is what Beit Sha'an is called at this time, is the only one west of the Jordan River. All the other cities of the That's Decapolis right. are on the east side, right. mm -hmm. including uh, sites in Jordan. Amman Many, itself, um, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. That's, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got Jerash and Gadara. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. that's right. So that's right. So uh, Beit Sha'an was the one that was on the west side. Right. Um, and um, it was called City of the Scythians because, according to a Greek legend, Dionysus was, um, uh, who was uh, uh, a when the uh, god died, uh, excuse me, when uh, his nursemaid, uh, Nisa, died, she was, according to this Greek legend, buried here at Scythopolis. And there is a temple, the foundations of which you can see here, steps leading up to what would have been the building here. This is a temple to Nisa, mm -hmm. um, commemorating the nursemaid of Dionysus. So Dionysus was actually one of the main gods associated uh, with this uh, city, right, right, right. and you actually see on the right there this altar, the face it's on the here. right there that is right. Dionysus, and this then we have Pan, Pan, mm -hmm. the god yes. Pan, which means all. Uh, That's right. All. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then something happens. Yeah, that uh, city that was a pagan city. Mm -hmm. A uh, pagan Roman city becomes Christian under Constantine and even had its own bishop and churches. And so you see here a mosaic floor from the Christian right. era. Thank you so much, Bob and Larry, mm -hmm. and all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope this program has provided some enlightenment for the mind and some food for the soul and look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.